the other thing that we can tell if we, if we wanted to look at Mercury's rotation, uh, as Mercury rotates, we already saw this before, as an object rotates towards you or it rotates away from you, there's going to be a Doppler shift. So if you're trying to uh, radar, for instance, image something like this or laser image something like this, you've got, if the planet is moving like this and it's moving at one point, uh, the, the signal that you're, that you're bouncing off of this is going this way and at the other point it's going that way when it's actually going away from you or coming towards you uh, as this is, you know, as, well, it's not, wouldn't be, wouldn't be go, it would still be coming towards you. But these, um, as this is moving this way, what's going to come back is a wave that's going to be bigger than the wave, if the initial wave was, was sent in at, let's say, the wave that actually came in here look like this, then it's widened. Some of what's going to return is going to be widened, and some of what's going to be, be what, what will return will be narrowed. It's going to be redshifted in this direction, if it is rotating this way. It's going to be redshifted uh, as it's moving this way, and it's going to be blue shifted as it's moving this way. So this is, red this is the redshift, and that's the blue shift. So we can see that uh, in our return signal, uh, we're going to see uh, that, the, that we're going to get a shift depending on whether we, we're, we're getting the signal from this side or that side. Uh, we're going to see either a red shift or a, or a blue shift in the signal. One thing I didn't mention is that when an asteroid or a meteoroid hits, hit the surface of the moon or it hit the surface of, um, of Mercury, uh, it caused, what actually happens is it actually caused uh, material from this tremendous kinetic energy of this object being struck by a, by a large object. Material is ejected. This is called ejecta. And it's strewn around the uh, outside of the, of the crater. So if you look at a crater, what you'll find is it's not just a hole, it's not just a hole in the ground, but it's a hole in the ground that seems to have sort of like mountains around it. And that's the ejecta actually piling up as this material is, is, is strewn out of there. So you see the, this pattern of ejecta uh, both in Mercury and uh, also uh, on the Moon. Now, one other interesting thing about the Moon uh, is the uh, concept of, uh, and it's, it's still posed somewhat of a, of a question, how much water, if any, is actually present on the moon? So if you're ever going to colonize the moon or any other planet or satellite of any other planet, assuming that you could do that, uh, you would really need to have water. If you don't have water, then you have to bring the water with you. And that's a very, very expensive proposition. Because water, even in space, uh, well, it's not just that it's in space, but the point is we have to, it takes up space uh, on, the, on the craft. And if you're going to try to establish a colony, you need a lot of water. You can't bring uh, uh, a few uh, gallons of it. You probably have to bring, you might have to bring millions of gallons. So that really does create a problem. So it'd be a lot nicer if we could actually find water uh, on the surface. And it turns out that water apparently does exist on the moon, but there's a question of, uh, and it doesn't exist as liquid water, it exists as ice. So it may exist in permanently uh, shaded uh, uh, floors of craters near the poles. That seems to be the case. It seems to be in a small, in small, uh, what we might, might want to refer to as lakes that might be just below the surface. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the lunar soil, uh, if you want to call it that, I mean, there's a very, very fine uh, coating of uh, dust uh, throughout the moon. And uh, th th this, this dust can be fairly thick at points. It's somewhere between maybe uh, 60 meters and 150 meters in thickness. So depending on uh, whether you're on the uh, near side of the, uh, of the moon, the side that's actually facing the Earth, it's, uh, it's about two and a half times thicker on the, on the, on the uh, dark side of the moon. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in that soil, the amount of water is, uh, is, is, is small, it's pretty, it's pretty dry. But there could be, in some areas, as much as uh, one part in about 100,000 parts of the soil. The other feature that you see on the lunar surface are things that are called rills, R-I-L-L-E-S. And rills are areas where uh, a lot lava 
molten lava actually flowed at one point in time, um, but eventually it, it just hardened. And the rills, these areas where there are lava flows, uh, shows us that the moon had volcanic activity early on in its history. It's, there do not appear to be any active volcanoes anymore, but at one point in time the moon was volcanically active. And that probably ended about three billion years ago. Now, Mercury's surface, if we look at Mercury com uh, compared to the Moon, it looks sort of uh, like the lunar surface, as I said before, but one of the things is that, uh, for instance, the ejecta on a crater on Mercury seem to be much closer to the crater than they are on the Moon. And that's easily explained if you realize that the, that the gravity on the Moon is about half of the gravity uh, uh, on, uh, on Mercury. So anything that's going to be ejected from the moon surface will go a lot further than it would if this is the, um, if this is the moon, it's going to go further than it would if, this, uh, if we're talking about Mercury. When that hits, then those things are not going to go as far. So the, you know, we'd expect to see the area, the sort of mountainous area around the crater, uh, the, eje the ejecta, would actually be closer to the crater uh, on Mercury, and that is the case, in fact. Uh, craters uh, on Mercury are, are less densely packed, and the inner crater, inner crater planes uh, cover about 40% of the planet's surface. The crater walls are also not as high, again, because of the, uh, the fact that Mercury has a, has a higher uh, uh, gravitational field, and uh, material does not pile up as high either, and it's closer to the craters, which I also mentioned. There's also another feature uh, on Mercury that you don't see at all on, um, on the Moon, and these are things called scarps. So this is on Mercury only. Scarps, not on the Moon. Uh, you will, you will, you'll have the, some of the other features on, 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 both, uh, on both the Moon and Mercury. Uh, these are not, uh, they're, 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 they're actually look like cliffs, and they don't appear to be volcanic in nature, and they cut across several craters. So you might actually have a crater here, and then you have a crater here, and then you have this scarf, this cliff, that it, it actually it goes across uh, a number of these craters. Now that would seem to indicate that, uh, that uh, they, they must have formed after the impact that actually gave rise to the craters. Otherwise, we wouldn't see they would have had to have formed after the impact because otherwise uh, the impact would have actually destroyed uh, that part of the scarf that we see inside the crater. So the current theory of, of how these things uh, form is that um, when the planet was, was actually cooling and its surface was starting to, um, uh, you know, maybe it was still somewhat uh, uh, fluid in nature, as it start, started to cool, the outer surface uh, began to harden a little bit, and then as it continued to cool, uh, it, the interior of Mercury began to shrink a little bit. And if you can imagine uh, uh, something uh, cooling down where it's got an, uh, it's got an out outer shell, as the inside begins to shrink, this is going to pucker and, and, uh, and, and wrinkle. So it's like a wrinkled skin around the planet. So it's thought that the, uh, uh, that the, scar the, the uh, scarps are actually uh, uh, wrinkles, wrinkles in the uh, surface of the planet that are caused by the contraction of the inner part of the planet as it cooled down a bit. Uh, there is a, a bullseye uh, asteroid strike, a uh, very large one on Mercury, that's uh, called the Caloris Basin Crater. And it's got this kind of like dark bullseye uh, appearance to it. Uh, on the inside. Apparently this asteroid hit the planet so hard that not only did it create this crater on the one side of the planet, but on the other side of the, of the planet it created a disturbance exactly, on, uh, exactly diametrically opposed to where the asteroid struck. On the other side of the planet it created uh, uh, something that they call weird terrain. And the weird terrain uh, basically is uh, wavy. If you look at it, it's wavy and it's a uh, ripple. It's got a lot of ripples in it. So that's something that had they observed this first and not seen this, uh, it would have been relatively difficult to explain what this, wave, what this wavy nature and ripple effect is on the surface here. But it's actually due to the, uh, to the tremendous kinetic energy of this, uh, of this object actually striking uh, Mercury. Uh, Mercury has a, uh, an iron core, 
Uh, it's got, uh, and the, the core actually accounts for 60% of its mass. Uh, it does have a, um, a magnetic field, but the moon has no magnetic field. Um, and it's considered that the uh, core of Mercury, uh, even though it's 60% of its mass, it's not moving nearly as rapidly as, um, say, the Earth's uh, core is. So the field is, is, is pretty weak, uh, but it's nevertheless a measurable magnetic field. Uh, the Moon has a very thick lithosphere, uh, about a thousand kilometers in thickness. This is the, uh, the, the rocky outer part of the, of, of the Moon. Uh, uh, the crust, which is the uh, very outside part of that, is relatively thick, about 60 kilometers. Uh, and uh, as I said, on the Earth's side, and 150 uh, on the dark side of the Moon. The Moon may have a molten core, but it's probably a pretty small core, so it looks a lot, lot different. Now, uh, how was the Moon actually formed? Uh, we've got a number of theories uh, regarding uh, the Moon's formation, and it turns out that uh, one, one theory, which is, which is known as the sister of her co-formation theory, says that the Earth and the Moon formed at the same time from some blob of material uh, that was coalescing uh, to, uh, to form these objects. So we had some primordial uh, material that actually split apart and one part of it became the Earth and the other part became the Moon. Well, that pretty much has been rejected by uh, any modern astronomers. Uh, and for the simple reason, well, one of the things that we can say is if that were true, we'd expect that the densities of the Earth and the Moon would be very similar. And in fact, we've seen that the Moon's average density is only about 60% uh, that of the Earth. So if we're looking at 5,500 uh, kilograms per cubic meter versus uh, 3,300 kilograms per, per cubic meter, it seems unlikely that that co-formation um, theory uh, would actually apply. So the co-formation, I would say, was rejected based on differences in mass. And uh, so we have another, another theory, uh, which is called the capture theory. And so in this particular theory, the moon forms independently so the Earth is uh, forming in the solar system. The Moon could have been a distant object. It may not even have been part of the solar system. But it had formed, the Earth forms, the Moon forms somewhere else. The Moon is just wandering along here and gets captured by the Earth's uh, gravitational field. And uh, that's how that works. Uh, but this is also highly unlikely because uh, it, you know, any kind of computer simulation that's done with this uh, really shows that that would be extraordinarily unlikely for uh, an object to have approached the Earth at just the right speed and just the right angle that uh, this would have actually happened. It's much more likely that this object would have maybe grazed by the, might have grazed by the Earth or might have moved the Earth or whatever. I mean, you know, even a small object like that, it, it wouldn't necessarily be captured. Maybe it would have actually plunged into the Earth. So it's, it's, it's the idea of it being captured as a satellite is kind of unlikely. Uh, another, uh, another theory is the uh, door, so this was also, uh, what do we call this, the capture theory, and again, very unlikely. And uh, another one is the daughter or fission theory, and in this theory, uh, the proto-lunar matter, that is before uh, the, the moon actually uh, had, had condensed into a solid object, it was actually torn off from the earth, as the earth hadn't solidified yet, now the Earth is rotating rapidly, and it's throwing off. You've seen that if you spin something very, very rapidly. Some of the material uh, will actually spin out. Some of that material will spin off. So it's thought that this, uh, some matter was thrown off and ultimately condensed into the Moon. So that is the uh, daughter or fission theory. Um, the molten Earth spins this material off. Um, the problem with this is that any computer simulation of that shows that the moon would not have had a stable orbit. It might have orbited for a period of time, but uh, eventually it would have, uh, uh, there, there's no uh, model that they have that actually sh uh, shows that the moon could have remained in a stable orbit. So what does that leave us with? Well, it's the uh, current theory, uh, which is called the impact theory, and this is kind of a, uh, uh, a hybrid of both the capture theory, which we said was unlikely, and uh, the daughter or fission theory. So in this particular theory, what actually winds up happening is rather than 
uh, material being thrown off from the Earth as it's spinning, uh, that the Earth was actually impacted um, a long time ago, billions of years ago, that the Earth was actually impacted by a very, very large uh, object, uh, maybe a, a, a Mars-sized object. So there could have been another, we don't really know what it was, but something quite large uh, actually winds up hitting the Earth. Uh, of course, this was long before there was any life on the Earth, because that would have completely extinguished any life, this, this particular, it was a, would have been a very, very violent uh, impact. So you've got the Earth here, possibly not quite solid yet, but maybe, maybe solid enough, and it's hit by something really huge, something big comes in here, and a big chunk of the Earth actually gets torn out. The Earth, as I said, isn't really completely solidified yet, so the Earth kind of reforms itself into a solid sphere over, again, over, over millions and millions of years. It, it reforms itself, and this other material that's out here that was broken off, all, everything that, that, that was pulled out of here actually coalesces these, all these little pieces that came off here. They coalesce and actually form the moon. And uh, then you've got, so you've got the moon there. Reformation uh, of both the Earth and the ejecta, which are actually lighter, because the heavier elements would, would tend, to, tend to have, uh, in the primitive Earth, the heavier elements would have ten, tended to go uh, uh, deeper down, and the lighter elements would have been uh, on, the, on the outside of the Earth. And so you know, we have like the iron core would be in here. So what was ejected wasn't really like the iron core, the really heavy part of the Earth, it was the lighter part of the Earth. So when this reformed, uh, this still had its iron core, the Earth still had its iron core, the Moon did not, or maybe had a very, very small part of the iron core, the, most of the iron core uh, was actually in the, uh, in the, in the parent, in the, uh, in the Earth, and the Moon, if it got any core at all, was very, very tiny. So the Moon's density is 3,300 kilograms per cubic meter, and the Earth's is uh, 5,500. And so this is consistent with, um, with what we actually observe. And the computer models uh, for this event show that it would, would have been possible to have gotten a moon-sized uh, satellite that would have stably uh, orbited the Earth in this particular fashion. So that uh, pretty much covers um, both of these chapters. And we'll look at, uh, next time, we'll look at um, Mars and Jupiter. And again, Thank you for your attention.